So hello and a very warm welcome to everyone from all of us at Hargreaves Lansdowne. A really big thank you for joining us today. We've had around 100 people register and I can see that most people have logged on. So let's get going. So our topic today is financial resilience. Uh, it's a really important element of financial well-being and highly relevant for employees in the current times. Now, if financial resilience is a relatively new term to you, then hopefully the next 40 to 45 minutes should help you to understand what it is, how to implement a financial well-being strategy that includes financial resilience, and give you an insight into what's keeping your employees awake at night. So, some introductions. I'm Richard Turner. I'm part of the team at HL Workplace, working with employers to provide modern new pension plans, workplace savings, and financial well-being programs for employees. Our first panelist today is Emma Jeffrey, corporate consultant at Hargreaves Lansdowne. Delighted you can be with us. Hi, Emma. Good morning, Richard. Hi. And next we have Alistair Stewart-Hunt, client relationship manager. Alistair works with employers to help increase employee engagement. Morning, Alistair. Good morning, Richard. Hope your internet's working okay. You know, sometimes it uh, can be a bit, uh, bit touch and go. Uh, we also welcome Dom Carroll. He's financial wellbeing specialist. Hi, Dom. Hi, uh, good morning, Richard. Now, I'm sure you're all Zoom experts by now, but just a quick reminder to use the Q&A button, which appears when you hover over the bottom of your screen. It is, after all, a question and answer, so don't be shy. Ask um, uh, any questions we, as we go along, and we'll be doing our best to answer as many of them at the end of the webinar. So there's never been a greater need to support your employees' financial well-being. We all know that the well-being of your employees has always been important, but never more so since COVID. Mental, physical, social, and financial well-being are all inextricably linked but perhaps it's financial well-being that's the most complex for HR managers to implement with employees. Now, a recent study by Close Brothers called The Changing Trends in Financial Well-Being, which was published uh, just a month ago in June, had both good and bad news. Now, according to the research, money worries distract 39% uh, of employees at work. Now, if you're worried about paying your bills, you're going to be less efficient, and hence less valuable to the business. It also said that 37% of people have less than £2,000 in cash. Now, that kind of puts things into perspective as we're discussing financial resilience today. Also, 33% of employees aged 55 and over don't know the value of their pensions. And I think that reflects the general apathy around pensions but it's very worrying that people that close to retirement are still not engaged. Now, there also was some slightly better news. And the research showed that people realise that they can actually live quite happily spending less. If you haven't been furloughed and been fortunate to have maintained your normal income, but without the cost of meals out, holidays, and perhaps even the daily runs to the coffee shop, then in the future, you could consider changing your habits and redirecting the surplus to bolstering savings and increasing investment, perhaps. The research also showed that 50% of employees want to make a change to their finances since COVID. And I think it's been a bit of a wake up call. It's focused people's minds on the what if scenarios. What if you lost your job, became seriously ill or even died? How would you and your family cope? And the final bit of good news is that 65% of uh, people think that improving financial well-being is actually a shared responsibility with their employer. Now, I think that's good news. It's an opportunity for you to step up and help your employees at a really crucial time and be seen as a caring, responsible employer. So with all that in mind, on to our first speaker. Emma, you've been doing a lot of work around financial resilience. Uh, help if I could say it, wouldn't it? Um, a lot of uh, work around financial resilience recently. So what actually is financially, financial resilience? You might want to come off mute. Um. Oh, sorry. Good morning, everyone on the call. So just to touch on financial resilience, it really is an important buzzword at the moment. 
And for me, what it means is really trying to build up some immunity against possible financial shocks that you're just not foreseeing. So what does that mean? Well, it really includes a few things. It's protecting you and your family from um, possible worst case scenarios, for example, falling long term ill and, and losing your income. It's building up a pot of cash for an emergency, really making sure you're not holding on to any bad high cost debts. And finally, it's also thinking about the longer term. So building up financial resilience for your retirement as well. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So in your experience, have you seen that people are saving or actually spending through COVID? I don't want to talk about my personal situation on this, Richard, but um, I suppose for the majority, lockdown was undoubtedly an opportunity to save a bit more and to spend a bit less. Don't get me wrong, I think some of us have been guilty of a bit of online spending. So things like uh, Amazon and ASOS, those online retailers um, have seen a growth in sales and their share price. Hopefully I haven't contributed too much to that. Um, but online shopping aside, um, we know that a quarter of a household typical expenditure couldn't actually be spent during lockdown. So that's things like holidays, transport, um, all the things we'd regularly spend money on. So there's definitely been an opportunity to take stock and to save a little bit more. Our own personal analysis has showed that 45% of people have managed to save. But I think there's something really important in terms of another trend that has happened alongside this, and that's really people being able to um, clear off some of their credit card debt. We've had decades of relatively high levels of consumer debt. And you'll be pleased to hear that in April, we collectively as a nation managed to pay off 7.4 billion pounds of consumer credit card debt, which is fantastic. And if you look at April and May, they were both record levels of paying off consumer debt. I think lastly, I would just say that it's certainly not been easy for everyone to save. Um, those on lower salaries and those who have been on the furlough scheme have obviously seen a bit of a dip in their earnings. And it will, of course, be more difficult for them to squirrel money away. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting to see different people affected in, in different ways. We're, we're beginning to see the beginning of a sort of easing of lockdown, you know, um, people starting to go back to work. Uh, some people I've been talking to opening their offices back up if people want to to go back to work. What do you anticipate that people will do when lockdown lifts? That's, that's a really interesting question. I think, well, from my own perspective, I'm definitely fairly optimistic. I think that lockdown has been an opportunity for people to recalibrate and really think about their spending habits and fundamentally learn to live with a bit less. So I think there will be some long term systemic changes to people saving a little bit more and thinking about the future. So that's really positive. But that said, the government is, of course, now trying to tease us back out of our homes and try and get us spending again in the economy. So you may have seen in the news the new government initiatives such as um, discounted feasting during the week, which they're calling the eat out to help out um, initiative to try and get us back into the pubs and restaurants. So with all this um, drive to try and get us spending again, who knows whether our, our long term habits will fundamentally change, but I certainly hope so. Yeah, and thinking, thinking about um, the amount of cash that people should hold, uh, is there any sort of analysis around how much people should hold and, and how much they actually do? Yes, absolutely. So I think it's important that we, we sort of park to one side um, things that you might be saving for within the next five years. So whether that be a new kitchen, a holiday, a bike, um, those things, of course, you need to save as cash. But I think the interesting part to this question is really the emergency cash pot. So what we typically say is a broad brush approach to that is that you ought to be thinking about 
three to six months of your typical expenditure being held as cash in the bank. And that will give you some protection from possible income shocks, such as loss of earnings, or indeed expenditure shock, so having to replace the boiler or new kitchen appliances. So there's certainly um, a lot that people need to think about in addition to their regular saving. Uh, so what does that look like in terms of pounds and pence, in terms of how much money people should have? Well, based on the average person in the UK living alone, that looks like £4,000 in the bank. And that, that's around about the three months of typical expenditure. So there comes the killer question. Well, do people have £4,000 in the bank? And you won't be surprised to know that an awful lot don't. So the actual analysis around this shows that nearly half, 49% of people under the age of 45, in fact, hold less than £1,000 as cash. And I think that really does go right across the board. If you look at really high earners, um, those earning between £100,000 and £250,000, the analysis shows that actually 14% of those people, in fact, have less than £1,000 in cash. There's certainly a gap between what people should hold and what they do hold. Yeah, absolutely. And also talking to employers, you know, hearing about um, being able to cater for different people at different life stages, you know, graduates you know, trying to pay off student debt right the way through to, uh, you know, raising families and into retirement. So looking into the, the longer term, what do you think is going to happen about long term resilience, people be changing their habits or anything like that? Uh, it's a good question. So I think long term resilience it is incredibly important and often perhaps we're a bit guilty of overlooking the long term whilst we prioritise short term financial priorities. Um, but I, I would say the key to long term financial resilience is really to continue to save a decent level of contribution into a pension pot to start early and just to keep up those payments. So how much should you contribute? Well, we would say that 12%, if you start right at the beginning of your career at age 18, and you carry that all the way through to retirement, perhaps age 68, that should give you a modest level of retirement income. But of course, you will need to save a little bit more um, if you want a particularly luxurious uh, retirement or indeed you want to retire early. So they're all things to, to think about. What we have seen during lockdown is, in fact, one in 10 people have reduced or stopped paying in pension contributions. And our key message would be to encourage employees of every company to stick with it, to keep their, up their regular pension savings and to really maximise the free money from the company. Absolutely. And it's a matter of sort of juggling your, your priorities. Emma, thank, thank you very much. Maybe we'll come back to you, see some questions coming in that I'd like to put to you um, later on. So if you could stick with us. I'd like to move on to uh, the first poll for today. Um, and bearing in mind what we're talking about today, I'd um, like to um, ask you to contribute your answers, please. So the question is regarding the financial benefits that your company provides. So, for example, we're talking about pensions, life cover, uh, medical, etc. To what extent has the level of employee inquiries changed since COVID? So if it hasn't really changed, click one. If you've had a reasonable increase, a few employees have asked about your financial benefits, click two. And if there's a, been a big increase, you've had a lot of questions. Uh, since COVID-19, click three. So if you could just click on that, a couple more coming in. Okay, so, yeah, I think we're just about done there. So just going to show, just going to end that poll and share those results. So the vast majority haven't seen a big change. So 62% um, haven't seen a change. Uh, a quarter, 20, 30, you know, almost a third have seen a reasonable increase or a large increase um, in inquiries. So um, people becoming more aware of what employers provide and actually maybe that would indicate that what you're providing could 
come under closer scrutiny from your employees as well. Okay, fine. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to close that poll. And moving on, um, Alistair, so uh, you probably want to come off mute as well, so that's great. So Alistair, you work with employers mainly in HR roles, so <coughs> you've probably got some pretty good idea of, of what, um, what's on their agenda. So first of all, are you finding that your clients are talking about financial resilience and what would your definition be of financial resilience? Uh, yes, well, good morning, Richard. Um, so are they talking about resilience? Absolutely, they are talking about financial resilience. Um, however, I would say that many employers don't really know where or even how to start actually uh, providing that kind of support around resilience. It's, it's one of those words, like Emma said, it's a buzzword. It's a bit like engagement, hard to define, almost impossible to measure. Um, so I would define that, um, you know, is, is the ability to kind of bounce back from significant stress or, or pressure. But I think it's broader than that. It's about having that sort of positive growth mindset that's, that's kind of willing to adopt new behaviors to thrive under pressure. So if you take that broader definition of resilience and transpose that to the kind of the arena of personal finance, I think that gives you a better understanding of what we mean by financial resilience. So yes, absolutely. It's about having that that emergency cash to see through a period of low or no in, no income but i think it's more than that it's about taking back control of those areas where we often feel a little bit out of control we don't really have a handle on our finances so it, it's about enhancing people's basic knowledge and understanding it's about demystifying all that awful financial jargon that we find is so prevalent it's about giving people confidence and actually the motivation to manage their money well. I think where it's delivered really well, what you tend to find is that employees are going to have a better chance of avoiding that over indebtedness and actually begin to use financial products much more appropriately. Obviously, that's great for employees, but it's great for employers too, because obviously you're going to have happier, more productive and more engaged staff. Yeah, it kind of makes, makes absolute sense. So, um, what appears to be uh, the main areas of concern that your clients have around financial resilience since COVID? Um, yeah, well, I think um, w what I've sort of found is that actually want, once the, the, the initial health shock uh, was over and we, and we sort of moved into lockdown proper, I mean, all, most of people were sort of at home. I think the, the focus very quickly became on mental well-being um, and rightly so. ONS data suggests that you've got lots of people really struggling. So about a third reporting high levels of anxiety. And while we know that financial stress does impact our, our mental well-being, I think it's fair to say also that a, a poor general level of, of, of you know, mental well-being is going to magnify any existing financial concerns that we have. And the risk there is that people are going to make perhaps some more irrational or emotional decisions um, from that place of anxiety around their finances. Obviously, that's what we, not, what we want to, to try and avoid. And I think employers have done a great deal on the, on the mental front, on the mental well-being front. So lots of communication, so direct communications uh, to staff, signposting really helpful articles or podcasts or videos, signposting existing benefits they have like um, the PMI uh, and that sort of thing but actually when it comes to financial well-being as opposed to mental I think actually very in, well, in my experience many employers don't really know where to start and I think that does cause them a big a big concern and I think that um, lots of companies have done really little more than just signposting their employee assistance program or citizens advice bureau but I think there can be a lot more that can be done. Well, bearing that in mind, what can employers do to help improve financial resilience for their employees? Mm. Mm. So, so what was quite interesting, actually, in the wake of the financial crisis in 2008 is actually we did see a, a pretty modest increase in the level of, of kind of general financial capability in the UK. Um, as people were shocked into taking personal, more personal responsibility, which is a good thing. But we have clearly regressed since then. So, you know, basic concepts 
uh, like interest rates, interest rates, poor interest rates on our on our uh, on our savings, and interest rates on our on our debt. These are not concepts that are well understood, uh, and these factors do cause stress. And it's well documented that this is a a cause of um, workplace absence, reduction in productivity and engagement, and ultimately that the business is bottom line. So I think that now would be a very good time in the wake of the pandemic to actually go back to basics and help people take back control. So in light of that, um, here would be my sort of five top tips for employers who wish to build a kind of, a, a kind of financial resilience program. So number one, I would assume you know what the topics are. You should ask them, what are the issues that are keeping you up at night? So, and actually employers can do that really easily. So you can use online surveys like SurveyMonkey or that sort of thing, it's free software. You can email them directly. You can do employee forums. Um, you can do leaflet drops for those people who are still on site. Um, so, but whatever you do, you've got to start with, with the issues that are affecting them, that are the live issues right then. And I think the, 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 the upside of doing that is if you address their concerns, you're gonna get a much higher level of participation and engagement in what you're delivering. So that's the first thing. Secondly, is think about actually who's going to deliver this. Um, are you going to do this in-house or are you going to get some external providers to, to do this for you? Uh, and again, in my experience, I'd say that most companies will at least start by saying, look, we're going to do this in-house. So, so look at what resources you already have access to. You know, scroll your, your intranet and actually see what helpful information is there already. What benefits have you got? Speak to your existing providers and, and, and advisors and see what they can provide you. And then where there are gaps uh, in, in what you can provide and what people want to, to know about, there are loads of free resources you know, online. And again, speak to your advisors or providers. They have access, might have access to budgeting tools, calculators. And of course, there's the money and pensions advice service. And pension wise is also available for those people who are approaching retirement. Um, thirdly, I always say to my clients, start with the end, i.e. Um, you need to work out what, it, what is it that you want your people to do? What action do you want them to take as a result of your intervention? Okay, and then you need to then remove almost every barrier to action. Okay, so if you're gonna to talk to people about budgeting, you need to provide them with links to, to budgeting tools. If you're gonna to talk to people about starting up a, a savings habit, you need to direct them to somewhere where they can actually start saving ideally that should be that should be via payroll fourthly um when you're building your you're making a plan or building your strategy you should build in some kind of measure of effectiveness so you can actually work out actually how successful has our has our, our planning been how successful has the program been you want to know how many people have taken action as a result of your intervention. So for example, how many people have clicked on a budgeting tool? How many people have set up online access to their pension? How many people have started a, a payroll ISA alongside their pension? These are all measurable over time. So you can understand actually how successful you've been or not. And in fact, even if you, if you haven't been successful, that is still really valuable because it will help you actually work out, well, what do we need to do differently next time? And then finally, what I'd say is um, aim for progress, not perfection. Okay, so financial education is a journey. Okay, it's all about marginal gains. It's those seemingly insignificant small changes that are going to make a massive difference over the long term. So, for example, it's about increasing your pension contribution by, say, 1% a year. It's going to make a massive difference. It's about trying to make sure that if you're going to start saving, do it on the day you get paid, not at the end of the month when there's nothing left. Okay, so it's all about those small marginal gains. And companies need to commit to financial education for the long term. It's not something you can deliver in a week or one webinar. It takes commitment from a company. And I think what you'll find is that the more you deliver it, the more refined it becomes, the more effective it becomes. And again, over the long term, that's going to lead to happier, more engaged, and more productive employees. Alistair, that's, that's absolutely super soft. Thank you very much for, for that. I've seen a couple of questions coming, which I'm going to refer to you later on. So um, 
be prepared for that. Um, I just wanted to move on to our next poll, which is kind of relevant to what you were, which is talking about. Um, and this poll is about financial well-being. So the question is, has COVID prompted you to think more about your employees' financial well-being? So if you've already got a financial well-being program in place, and you're quite happy with that, uh, click one. If it's on the agenda, but you haven't got around to it yet, click two. And if you are actively planning to introduce a financial well-being program, click three. So, still some clicks coming in. Interesting. If you're all done, I'm just going to end that now and share those results. So that's very interesting. So 14% already have a financial wellbeing program. Uh, vast majority, it's on the agenda, but we haven't got around to it, uh, which is, I think, probably, uh, sorry, and I probably hear that quite a lot from clients. Um, and also 25% actively planning to introduce a financial wellbeing program. So this is obviously um, a hot topic. So thank you very much for that. Um, just going to close that and move on to Dom. So Dom, you've been waiting very patiently. Thank you very much. So you um, work with employees day to day. So can you first of all tell us what a financial wellbeing specialist actually does? Yeah, no problem at all. I think it's a, probably a good place to start. So so I usually travel the country and, and deliver a wide range of financial education presentations, uh, mainly to workplace clients from, from really a multitude of different industries. I would say I spend most of my time um, meeting with employees face to face to help them improve their, their knowledge, understanding and, and confidence around financial topics that are relevant to them. So as you can imagine, our presentations often prompt people to think about their own finances and how they might be able to become more financially secure. After running a few presentations, we would then hold some one-on-one -on -one meetings with employees so we can focus more on issues that are a real priority for each individual. Their queries can be very varied, so it, it does mean that we have time to provide assistance where it's actually needed. Currently, for example, we're running webinars and virtual one-to-ones via Zoom instead of, of to reach those of us who, who, who need assistance, but it's now in the comfort of their own home, which is, which is pretty good. Yeah, and I think we've all had to adapt to, uh, to the new situation, but actually I think we found, you know, some can, can sometimes reach more people by doing it virtually. So what sort of questions yeah. um, are you finding, um, what sort of questions are employees asking you regarding financial resilience in your one-to-ones and in the webinars? Yeah, so, so really, as Alastair has mentioned, financial resilience f f for me is about being in control of our finances and building the confidence and ability to manage our money more effectively. So for most people that we help on a daily basis, the primary concern is balancing debt with saving for the future. So people often find it difficult to weigh up one financial strategy against another, as they often feel that they're missing something or maybe some kind of uh, some piece of information that would enable them to make uh, an informed decision. So, for example, um, I recently held a couple of days of video one-to-one -one meetings with employees of a property investment company. A recurring question we were getting was whether to focus on paying off their mortgage, a student loan, any other debts that they have, or whether they should be saving for the future and taking more advantage of accounts their employer offers. So, in this case, it was a self-invested personal pension, so a SIP that was the, the key account. So in this scenario, I highlighted the considerations for both options and provided useful tools that can show the potential annual saving if there was a focus on debt reduction and also the tax saving and potential uplifting contributions from the employer if they focused on saving into the SIP. And I think going through these sorts of live issues in a one-to-one -one gives people that confidence to, to make their own decision. So from what you're saying, is, is, this actual, is this financial advice or are you just giving people guidance at this stage? No, yes, it's a really good point. No, so it, we aren't providing financial advice for these employees, but rather it, it's guidance to help them make their own decisions. So it enables them to take control of their, their own understanding of their finances, which I'd say probably helps them more in, in the long run. 
but but I'd also add that another very common topic uh, aside from kind of debt management and so on that comes up in, in our meetings is, is building an emergency fund or, or reaching financial targets like for example saving for a house that's a priority for for a lot of first-time buyers for example so to tackle this we often start with the basics such as budgeting by using uh, budget calculators and other tools they can start start with a financial goal that they have in mind and kind of work backwards from this figure to understand how much they should be saving each, each month or even each week. And it's, it's remarkable actually how many people try to save what they have left at the end of the month rather than saving, the, saving first and then spending what they budgeted for. So simple behavioral changes like prioritizing saving or spending can really help employees reach their, their financial goals on, on their terms. And, and after budgeting, we can then help people understand how to implement a savings plan often looking at ways to receive further savings boosts. So in the case of an individual saving for their first property, we might highlight the lifetime ISA where you can receive a 25% uplift from the government on your, on your contributions. And, and really for a lot of people that will make owning their own home uh, much more of a, a possibility and, and a reality a lot sooner. But, but really, yeah, we, we find that by holding these open one-to-one -one conversations we, we can cut through the jargon so people feel that they can ask the questions that they're either too scared or, or embarrassed to ask and a lot of people that i i speak to have, have heard of the financial products that, that we've mentioned there but not had the confidence to investigate further so so us being on site removes those barriers like like alistair had mentioned absolutely so the, uh, you know we we know that coronavirus pandemic has put a lot of people under financial strain. Um, have you seen a change in the discussions that you hold with employees? Yeah, yeah definitely. There's been, there's been a few changes. Um, I'd, I'd say at the start of the pandemic, we were experiencing a few questions about mortgage holidays and, and the knock-on effect that taking a holiday might have. People didn't really know what impact lockdown would have on their income. So while taking a break can ease your financial restraints at the moment in the short term, it could mean that you have to pay more back in the long run. And once people have all the pieces of the puzzle, they find they're, they're more confident about making a decision. The final thing I'd probably say is that we've, we've noticed it's a far greater interest in personal finance generally. So the shock of the pandemic and uncertainty of the future means people are definitely taking a closer look at their spending habits and they're now prepared to cut it down where necessary, which is actually probably a bit of a positive to come out of this scenario. It's supported by research from Ipsos, which states that 46% of people between 18 and 75 in the UK say that they need to save more and spend less in response to the coronavirus outbreak. So while most of the topics that we're used to talking about are, are not new, we, what we are finding is that there are, is a new willingness from employees to take action. But these same individuals still need a helping hand to, to build a plan, and, and that's where we come in. Absolutely. So many thanks to, to Dom and also Nathan and Al, um, to Alistair and Emma. So we've been hearing from uh, some of our um, attendees with some live questions. So uh, I'd like to put those to, to you guys. So first of all, this is one for, for you, Dom, if you don't mind staying on. So I had a question uh, mentioned earlier on. Is the 12% recommended pension contribution the total contribution, including employer and employee contributions, or just the employee contribution on top of employers? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And it's, it's one that we're asked quite a lot by employees because we do provide these kind of benchmarks to, to aim for and so on. Um, employees are usually glad to hear it's not just their own contribution, but also the employer contribution as well. And it does include tax relief that, that they're receiving. So initially looking at that 12%, for some people that can be a bit daunting, but actually, there could be three different elements to this. It could be their personal contribution, the employer's contribution, and also the tax relief they're receiving. So when we break that down and, and show how you can get there, it, it does seem a lot more achievable and, and people are a lot kind of warmer to the idea of increasing their contributions to a, to a reasonable level. Okay, thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, one for you, Alistair. So um, we have, in terms, in terms of from an employer point of view, what would you suggest as a first step towards supporting financial well-being? Our company has only in the last year or so introduced a well-being team that covers all types of well-being, so it's quite new to us. I'm keen to introduce financial well-being, but I suspect it will need to be baby steps. Okay. Um, well, I suppose 
the financial stress is often caused by is that feeling of being out of control. So actually helping employees understand and have a plan and taking back that control. That, that's what's sort of critical. Um, I think, like I said in, in, in my section, I think there's no harm in actually trying to understand what the issues are first. So you, you're not committing to providing all the information. You're just trying to find out what the issues are and then you can work out how you can do that later on. I think for many employers, um, I think a pe the pension would be a good place to start. It's a key benefit. It costs the company a lot. It's not well understood. And you can also rely perhaps on your provider to provide some of that, uh, some, some sort of helpful information. Lots of providers will provide those kind of um, uh, presentations or some kind of webinars. They may even have videos and that sort of thing. So I think um, if you're going to take some baby steps, um, the low hanging fruit would be things like pension. Um, where you can speak to providers and get that support as well. That would be a good baby step. Brilliant. Thanks, Alistair. Um, I think this one is for, um, for you, Emma. So we have got our benefits renewal coming up and we're thinking about offering something that will boost financial resilience. What benefits would you suggest? That's an interesting one. I think I may um, defer over to Alistair for a, a bit of extra comment on this, but um, I think it really does take um, a step beyond perhaps things like an EAP that a lot of people have in place and to think about the broader picture in terms of financial well-being and as Alistair said, the pension. Um, Alistair, I know you've got a lot of experience in this area, so over to you for a bit more comment there. Yeah, so I think, I think EA, EAPs are, are the obvious choice. They, they, they are very helpful in terms of dealing with um, debt and financial worry. I think um, two, two things I'd just sort of comment on EAP. One is they do require proactivity on the part of the employee to know what's available under the EAP and go there. And I think often an EAP is seen as is like a bit of a last resort. Um, so for a few, you know, for a small number of people, they really will be the lifeline. But I think for the majority of people, um, they will probably have a mindset, well, it's, it's not that bad. And therefore, the EAP is, is probably a little bit, um, it is not quite relevant. I think taking it back to financial education, I think, um, I think if you're going to provide that, um, that, that kind of support, financial education, for a start, it's actually, it's the proactivity is on the behalf, on the part of the, of the employer. You can tailor it, you can personalize it, it's going to be more engaging. And actually, when you get the right messaging right, um, it can be seen as a really inclusive whole of company journey to improve financial well-being. Thanks, Alice. Uh, nicely delegated, Emma. Um, one back to you, uh, Dom. So how would you advise approaching a global financial wellbeing program where you have different resources and infrastructure in place in each of those locations? Uh, a really tricky one. Yeah, certainly. So I suppose it's a kind of tailored approach, which is, which is really important. Again, Alistair will, will have more information on that, but it's, it's kind of listening to, the, to, to what your employees are looking for. So Alistair said previously that that was really important and a good place to start is Companies can be very varied from our experience and, and different areas might have different needs. So it's, it's listening to those employees to then put a, put a plan into place from there, being flexible and, and not kind of having a really rigid structure, which may not necessarily help everybody. Because as we say, I mean, everybody's issues are, are very different. So it's taking that, that balanced and, and adjusting approach. Okay, Dom, thank you very much indeed. Um, conscious of time, uh, there are a couple of other questions that we'd, we'd love to answer and we'll come back to you um, if you've asked those questions. Um, and indeed, um, you've got the opportunity to ask more questions um, on the feedback form later on. So I suppose the question now is having um, got excited about financial wellbeing and heard about financial resilience, what can you actually do to help your employees make more confident financial decisions. Well, first, of course, try your current pension uh, and benefits providers. And of course, if you have an advisor, go to them as well. But I also just wanted to briefly tell you about a new service that we're about to launch called Financial Wellbeing at Work. It would be delivered by Dom and his colleagues. Uh, it's an end-to-end -end service which includes us producing or helping you with employee surveys also producing emails and booking links that people can um, book into webinars and one-to-ones. We would also provide a, a feedback report so that you can actually measure how people um, are responding to that as well. Uh, 
all as a complete package. Uh, we look after it, most of it, um, for end to end. So if you'd like to any more details of that, let us know. There's also um, some free stuff that you can um, get access to. We're running another series of free employee webinars in August, including topics like at retirement, how to manage your money in a crisis and the gender pension gap. Now, I know some of you have attended those yourselves already, but we'll be sending out the links that you can send on to your employees so they can easily log on to those sessions if you wanted to use those um, for free. There's also um, an increasing uh, library of YouTube videos. Um, a lot of what Dom and his um, colleagues do is being recorded and put onto YouTube. So have a look at those if you want. And we've got another HR Q&A in October with another big focus on financial well-being. So look out for the details of those. So in a couple of minutes, you'll receive a feedback form. Uh, if you wouldn't mind completing that, give us an idea of what you've liked about today and also listen to ideas for future webinars. If you want to get in touch, usual, usual ways, give us a call, email, visit our website. Um, that's on the screen now. So thanks to the speakers, but um, more than anything else, very um, big thank you to uh, everybody for joining us today. I hope it's been useful and um, that you can go back and uh, get people motivated and put something in place to help your employees make smarter financial decisions. Stay safe. Have a great day. Thank you.